But I was, no matter what you wanted to do, the, everything about it was just so captivating to me personally that I was in, no matter what, whether it was an audiobook, whether we could do it into a TV show or what, you know, I was just stoked. So I guess we could start with when I sent it to you. Mm. And you told me when we talked on the phone after that that you were not excited about having to read something or thinking somebody sent you something to read. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> our good buddies at Big Picture Media, um, uh, I've been with them through my last two bands and they've done press for me and taken me on tours and got my band with Warp Tour. And she hit me up and was like, hey, there's a book that's coming that we um, do press for. And uh, I know the author and I want to send you the book. And I was like, I didn't even know you guys worked with, with, with authors or books. So I was like, okay, cool. And so that, that was like what I was prefaced with. And that was it. I had no idea really what the intentions were um, of yours to me. <coughs> yeah. and, uh, and I got the book. And the first thing I saw were all these like torn out pages in it, or it's what I thought were torn out pages, and then I pulled them out and they were like notes from you. And like two sentences into it, I was just like bawling my eyes <laughs> out, uh, but like in a good way, like I really needed it. <clears throat> like I just, like quarantine's been bizarre yeah. for everybody and it's like making you really sit alone with your thoughts and think about the past and whatever. And so I was doing that and I was like thinking of some stuff and I was just like, not in a weird place, but in a place of just like accepting the past and and just kind of really understanding it and my, my own past and and it was kind of about synchronicity and weird stuff like that and then your note was just like it it just hit me in the bottom of my heart and it was it was super intense um and then without even realizing what the book was about you know and then i'm an avid punk lover every single band that covers these every track in this book or bands that i've been like i either know personally or have been fans of them for my entire life and it was just more synchronicity. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Are you like stalking me or something? <laughs> um, and I was just in, I didn't even really know, I think at the time that you wanted me to do the audio book. I think I thought that like you already had the rights to do the TV show. And I was like, is that why he's coming to me for this? And, um, but I was, I, no matter what you wanted to do, the, everything about it was just so captivating to me personally that I was in, no matter what, whether it was an audio book, whether we could do it into a TV show or what, dude, I was just stoked. Track 1, 23, Jimmy Eat World. Ah, this is stupid. I call myself a writer. I once had a discussion with this guy who was, at the time, my best friend. This guy came up with a good idea for a book, or at least an idea for a book. He started working on it and one day asked me, does this mean I'm an author? I said, no. Authors are published. Writers are bitter. I call myself a writer, but I don't write. It's not because I can't, I'm actually pretty damn good at it. That is to say, I don't really give a shit what anyone else thinks. My writing is incredibly scrutinized by me. I go over and over it, I Google grammar questions, I check spellings of words I'm sure of, and I fall down black holes of research just to make whatever 80s pop culture reference perfectly accurate. If a reader doesn't like it, well, fuck them. I'm the worst kind of writer. One who writes for himself. Hello, unstable future. Now, as long as I think it's good, that's all that matters to me. That's not what I meant by this is stupid. If I thought that writing this book was stupid, I would do things differently. You know, for instance, I'm in a hotel room for a weekend. And the first things I packed were some Ambien for insomnia, Adderall for ADD, Xanax for anxiety, cigarettes for boredom, and a bottle of Johnny Walker for fun. Clothes and personal hygiene essentials were thrown on top of the necessities. Stupid? Possibly. If I thought so, I'd change my methods. Here's a stupid thing, not the stupid thing. I don't subscribe to the philosophy that great writers must abuse drugs and or alcohol. Although most of my favorites do, or did, until those things just weren't enough to do the trick anymore. I don't believe I write better after drinking or doing drugs, it's just that experience has shown that I actually write after drinking or doing drugs. 
I call myself a writer, but I don't write. Or at least I don't write what I need to, because the stuff I get paid to write is just enough for me to justify the label. Therefore, I actually can call myself a writer because I get paid to write, and my byline has been read by a lot of people, but that's work. I put in the least amount of effort to turn out a product that is still decent by my standards. It's not always what I want to write about. I call myself a writer because I have several books, screenplays, sketches, and a million other things written in my head. But in my head, there is no rejection, no confrontation. In entertainment journalism, what gives me the occasional paycheck, there's nothing personal. There's no looking for answers, there's no cause, there's no letdown, no consequences. It's safe. This weekend is not about being safe, hence the drugs and alcohol. It's time. I was looking at kind of who hot young Latino actors are. <laughs> I like Googled hot young Latino actors. Because like I mentioned in the book that I'm half Mexican and I do want to make it a TV show eventually. And so I wanted somebody to do the audio book, but I also have that person like hope that they were into it enough to like be along for the whole ride, sure. you know? And when I Googled that, I saw your name on there and I knew you from Workaholics. Mm -hmm. So like, mm -hmm. this actually goes back further than just me sending you the book. Cause I was the, one of the digital producers for Workaholics right. and you were on that episode. Right, um, right. So I knew you from that and I knew you from your bands cause Dana invited me when you guys played at Knitting Factory right. and I saw you there, um, but we'd never met. And so I, I knew that like you were somebody I'd want to do it, but then it blew me away that you were half Mexican mm -hmm. because like I, I would never would have guessed that from you, just like most people wouldn't think that of me because right. I look white. We're ambiguous. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but uh, so it all came together, man. It is that like synchronicity that I knew, I knew you well enough and like your talent well enough and that you like, I knew that you like DJed emo nights and mm -hmm. I, I'd seen you talk about like your uh, mental health stuff. And so the fact that that like half Mexican thing played in, I was like, okay, I gotta at least get a no from you, but Mm -hmm. I'm not, there's no one else that I could think of doing it, you know, until I get a no from you, yeah, you know? Sure, yeah. It only recently turned midnight, so in the last 15 hours or so, I've popped some Adderall, some Xanax, a few Stellas. That I picked up at the bodega before coming to this hotel, so my habit wouldn't leave me with a regrettable minibar bill. And a quarter of a fifth of Johnny Walker. I'm a writer. I don't do math. Yeah, I'm not Chris Farley or John Belushi because, contrary to the popular belief of those who know me, I do want to live. That's another problem. I want to live. This hotel I'm staying in is in the fucking middle of fucking Times Square in New York City. Can, can someone please tell me who the fuck enjoys Times Square? It's because I want to live that, even though I was committed to sitting in here drinking and writing, I left. I walked out of this hotel knowing very well what was outside. Tourists. Lots of fucking tourists. Actually, I, I don't hate tourists. I haven't been in New York for long, so I'm nowhere near native enough to talk shit. I just hate people. I am definitely native enough to this planet to know I hate people. I hate people and I hate crowds. Hence the Xanax and the cigarettes. I'm actually not a smoker. That's the best kind of smoker to be because a cigarette every now and then always does the job. And I never picked up smoking because I saw my dad try so hard to quit in his late 30s. The guy was on the patch, the gum, and still smoking. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I never saw him during his struggle with alcohol. He's 30 plus years sober, woohoo. So, I pour it down my throat like someone lost in a desert coming to his first oasis. Every happy hour, every shot, every pint is an oasis from life for me. Now it's not like life is hard for me. I think most mature adult drinkers can admit that drinking doesn't really change anything. Here's what it does change for me. Like I said, I don't believe a writer must drink or do drugs to be good, but I must drink and do drugs to write. Now, I'm not better or more creative, but I'm more in touch with my emotions. Now, I've never argued that alcohol isn't a depressant, and I've also never cared. 
What do we learn from the music and the books and the films that are about happy people? All of those things require conflict, heartbreak, and, and pain to deliver their message. Now, I'm not a bitter person uh, when I'm sober. I'm not a bitter person when I'm drunk either, but my mind is more in touch with the shit. I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky dude most of the time. I also don't write most of the time. You know when I write? On the train after a long day and night of drinking. Or anywhere after a long day and night of drinking. Eh, that's just how it works for me. Maybe one day the booze and the drugs won't do the trick for me anymore, and I'll go the way of some of my favorite writers. But a, a, a bigger part of me feels that if I, if I just write, if I just finish something, I'll be happy. And there have actually been those days when happiness just seems so far out of reach that the easy way out seems appealing. There was a very short period in my life, like a, a few months that I slept through, um, where I'd take a couple of Ambien in the afternoon, even though usually one would do the trick, pass out, wake up at night, and then take a few more to go right back to sleep. For this very brief, in the grand scheme of things, part of my life, I just wanted to sleep, and I didn't care if I woke up. I don't know if it was the height of my unhappiness, but it was, it was more about the lack of options that the U.S. Army provides to escape that unhappiness. But, as I mentioned earlier, luckily, I have that writer's ego that makes me think I'm too important to kill myself. This weekend, that is what is keeping me going. The world needs to hear what I have to say. Or at least that's what I think. And we've established that's all that matters. To me. And, like, when you first hit me up on this, this book and the note, I was just now realizing that, like, a lot of my trust and distrust, mistrust, detrust, untrust, <laughs> one of those things, uh, came from just me not fitting in to, in this acting world and really at a young age um, wanting to, even though I had a career and I wanted to act, I loved acting, but I didn't really necessarily like the people, um, I wanted to make myself normal by um, smoking pot, getting drunk at an early age, throwing up all over the place, and just kind of being like a, a, a delinquent a little bit. Um, and, and then that just really manifested itself into my lifestyle, which was kind of hard to navigate because I was a working actor, I had a career, I had a house, um, and yet like everything outside of my career was kind of falling apart, you know? And yeah. so, so yeah, that's, uh, I, I was able to just kind of really figure that out and understand the root of to why I, I was like that. Um, and so, you know, also punk at an early age was one of my ways to separate myself from acting. Even though I did fall in love with it, I do have a passion for it. That's why I've covered myself in tattoos. So yeah. I have to s somewhat be in that world, you know, for the rest of my life. That was like one of my, my things too. Cause like when I was, when I lived with my mom, um, and I moved out pretty quickly, like a month after I turned 18, mm -hmm. but she wouldn't let me get tattooed because she said she didn't want me to regret it and then blame her. <laughs> and as soon as I got out, I got like my first three tattoos within like two months of yeah. being on my own. But that was my thing too, is that I wanted to get tattooed because I never wanted to end up somewhere where I couldn't, that you can only get into without being tattooed. Yeah, yeah wait, if you don't have tattoos. Like, yeah. I didn't want to be anywhere like that. So I, I, yeah, I was like getting sleeves and stuff because I was like, hey, if they don't want, let me in because my tattoos, I don't want to be there anyway. Exactly, you know, because, yeah, because yeah, cause, like I grew up on punk and mm -hmm. I didn't want to be part of any other world, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, it was so, hard for me too because I started getting my leg tattooed first because I'm like, okay, well, fucking acting and no one's ever going to see my legs, yeah. really? <laughs> I don't really know. I, I had no idea. But like, I got a lot of resentment from my agents and my manager. Um, when I was younger, and just I didn't, I just, and, and there was another reason. I'm like, fuck, man, I don't fit in anywhere. Somebody accept me, you know, yeah. for the love of God, because I, 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 I couldn't accept myself, and so I was looking for it for other people. Um, but that's changed now because I fucking love myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, dude, and it's great that like it's super important to hear that from someone like what you got going on and stuff because that's also a part of the book for me. And it, you know, I talk about. Like I grew up in this shitty little small town where, you know, if you're a creative person, 
it's very hard to believe you're ever going to do anything because you have to get out and that's hard. I wrote this book when I got out. Like I, I was in New York City, which was like the dream. And I was working at Comedy Central and I won an Emmy within like a year of working there. And it's kind of the same thing, but like hearing it from you, who is much more well known than me, you know, like me, I'm just in a, like to people who read this book, I'm just a regular person, you know? Sure. And so like, I want people who are regular people to, to know that we don't feel this way because we don't have like everything we think we should have, you know? And like, cause you were, I mean, you are successful and you listed all those things that, you know, are benchmarks in your life and you were still dealing with that, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, and yeah, that was the thing for me because even though I wasn't like, you know, making my own TV shows yet or anything, I was on that track and I was, I was hitting benchmarks that were huge for me for being the, you know, little kid who never thought I was going to get out of that town. So like, to me, it was like, you know, having my own TV show and having my house and all that stuff because I was achieving these cool things, but none of that mattered. All the only thing that was in my head is what's in this book. And it's just depression and anxiety and like Absolutely. near suicide, yeah, you know, dude, I totally get that, which is insane, man. And so many people deal with that. And, yeah. and that's the crazy, like that's, that, I mean, I'm, I'll be 38 in November and that's something I just realized in the last two years because I found a good therapist, mm -hmm. you know, he's helped me understand that like, no matter how bad my shit is, it's not unique, you know, it's not like, there's no reason for me to let it stop me because like, to like think in my head, like, oh, nobody could ever understand what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I have it worse than anybody. And sure, it's okay to feel, to like recognize that. It doesn't mean your feelings aren't, you know, valid, but it's nothing that should stop you because it's not like, it's not unique. Everybody thinks that of their own pain. Mm -hmm. You know, we all think our pain is the worst pain that's ever existed. Of course. But it's not. We should, that should help us get through it, you know? Yeah, dude, that's, that is honestly what helped me just like, just like you, I used to feel so just disconnected from everybody because like I had a career when I was six years old yeah and I grew up in a small town he was you know it's in Los Angeles County but when you're a kid with no license fucking Hollywood's a world away sure yeah so I grew up in that same kind of small town football was the only thing that was like awesome um, and getting fucked up you know yeah. and I found it really hard to connect with my friends because I was making money and I had like this career and I, I would have to go off to different countries and do films and I would come back and they'd be like, yo, fuck your acting, dude, let's get high. <laughs> and I was like, okay, sure. And so for a long time, I didn't feel connected with anybody or anything because I also felt out of the loop with my acting career. But then I felt like my problems were worse than everybody's and I yeah. felt like uh, I, I just didn't feel like anybody. And then when I had these realizations, it was so, in a, in a sense, like relieving because I was like, dude, I am like everybody else and, and they're like me. And, and now I wanna use all of these tools and all of the shit that I've been through to help bring people out, just like you, man, like yeah. helping people out of whatever they're going through because it's, we're all the same, you know? And it's not as bad as you think it is. Okay, that was just a stupid thing, not the stupid thing. This is stupid. I left work today a little later than usual. My walk to West 4th to catch the C train is only a few blocks away, not too far from the Hudson River, so usually by the time I get out of work, there is an enjoyable sunset over Jersey City. Today was no different. It's been over a decade since terrorists flew those two planes into those two towers and changed everything about how we live. I was 18 when it happened. Still a kid. Kind of. I was living in Austin, Texas with my best friends and bandmates at the time. Sure, we were all affected by it, but I think for some people, the further you were from New York, the less it impacted you. Or maybe it was because I was a stupid kid. I really don't remember any period of time in my life where I had any kind of legitimate fear that I was in danger. At least not that kind of danger. Yeah, going through airport security is a pain in the ass, but I honestly can't recall any point when I had an actual fear of becoming a victim of a terrorist attack. Again, and I never really thought of this until writing this, but perhaps it's all chalked up to that self-involved teenage mindset. But, you know, even on the 10-year anniversary of 9-11, living in Manhattan, I still felt perfectly safe and didn't have a worry in my mind other than getting a music review into an editor. I would have loved to have gone to the memorial, but I avoided it. 
Not because I was afraid of a terrorist attack, but because I was afraid of a panic attack from being in the crowd. But today, years after the most horrible day in my lifetime, it finally happened. I was briefly hit with that fear, and, and it freaked me out. Like I said, I've only lived in New York City for a short time, so I don't really know how things work around here. In the two years before I moved here, I probably visited five times, and I spent a couple of months up here for an internship a few years ago. So I'm not right off the bus, but I'm still learning some things. I left work in a bit of a different mindset because rather than returning to my apartment, I was on my way to take advantage of luxury accommodations at the Times Square Renaissance Hotel for the weekend. On the days when I bust my ass at work, which is pretty much all of them, that causes a bit of anxiety in my fucked up brain. And while I have a pretty good supply of Xanax, that shit makes me sleepy. Unlike cigarettes, which will only give me cancer or emphysema. So I took my time, strolled the neighborhood that I work in, puffing on my camel. Crush, because I'm not a real smoker, remember? Watching the sunset over Jersey City and just relaxed. Probably for the first time this week. That's when the stupid thing happened. Actually, this requires a little bit more of a preface. Since I was determined to write this weekend, I started preparing myself early. Yes, I considered bringing a flask of whiskey to work and starting off early, but I made the responsible decision, which is rare for me, and I refrained from drinking on the job. I did, however, listen to sad bastard music all day. Booze, drugs, and sad bastard music get my mind and emotions exactly where they need to be in order for me to write. And women. Fucking women. Adjective, not verb. So the song that came on my iPhone when I strolled down Van Damme towards my 6th Avenue subway was Jimmy Eat World's 23, off their album Futures, which has always been my favorite Jimmy Eat World album. No, it's not because I haven't heard Clarity. No, I didn't discover Jimmy E. World along with the rest of the world when The Middle hit MTV. I'm not trying to be cool by saying I heard Clarity first. You'll find that I learned early enough in life that I am not cool. Therefore, trying is a fool's errand. Here, let me prove it. My discovery of Jimmy Eat World is something very, very uncool, but it's partially to blame on the tiny town I grew up in with almost no exposure to indie music or small bands since Clarity was on Capitol Records and not technically indie. As soon as I turned 18, I moved four hours north to Austin. Yeah, that's the only cool part of the story. When I lived in Austin, I worked at a Hot Topic in Barton Creek Mall, the rich white kid mall. I, I lived in a two-bedroom apartment with four other guys. So I got to know Jimmy Eat World through my cooler co-workers at a yuppie mall's Hot Topic not cool. But I discovered them when the song from Clarity, Lucky Denver Mint, was on the movie Never Been Kissed. So not cool. So I've loved the band forever, but it's futures that I keep going back to. The words to 23 aren't particularly relevant to this situation. The song just happened to be playing at that moment. That moment that, for a second, I thought could be my last. I That once we said goodbye No one else will know These lonely dreams No one else will know That part of me I felt for sure last night That once we said goodbye No one else will know These lonely dreams No one else will know That part of me not relevant to the situation, but I managed to always find a way to make songs I love relevant to my life. Actually, I'm pretty much an open book with those who get close enough to me. I just don't let many people do that. Even if I did, this city is not the easiest place in which to do that. I disagree with the New Yorker stereotype that says this city is filled with rude assholes, but I really feel like no one here is trying to make friends. I think New York City is probably within the asshole per capita average. There are just more people here, thus more assholes. One might draw the conclusion that it's possible that there are more nice people here too. 
You just have to find them. Which means you have to look for them. And who the fuck wants to do that? You'll sit alone forever if you wait for the right time. What are you hoping for? I'm here. I'm now. I'm ready. I'm holding on tight. I get it. I've been alone for the better half of a decade now. Sure, I've dated plenty and had plenty of flings, but no, nothing that stuck. I have no idea what the hell I was hoping for years ago when I left the best relationship I had ever been in with a girl who is still one of the best people I've ever met in my life. But, you move on. I won't always love these selfish things. Jim Atkins sings in 23. I won't always live, not stopping. That is exactly how I've lived for the last 10 years. Not stopping. I'm here, I'm now, I'm ready. I think. I mean, when I left that relationship, it was for one reason and one reason alone. There was no lack of love. There was no lack of attraction. I just wasn't there. I just wasn't ready to stop. Well, let's talk about the audiobook, man. Fuck yeah. Um, tell me about how you're, how you're approaching that and like what you, what you think about it. Because like, like we have talked about it, like since I've listened to the chapters you've recorded, I feel like I'm watching a show or like, you know, listening to a show about somebody else. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like you've made it your own, um, which is great. That's what I wanted. And that's kind of why I'm like, you know, hands off from it. But because like, I don't even feel like this book's about me anymore. I've, I right. feel more, you know, so much healthier. And so like, I don't, I don't want to listen to the audiobook and think that it's about me because it's not about me. It's about everybody who deals with this shit, mm -hmm. you know? But yeah, man, tell me like how you how you got into it and like what like what you thought about yeah. before starting it. Well, so. first of all, dude, I, I like I, I put it off way too long because I was dealing with the same shit that your character is dealing with in this book, and like I was really unhealthy mentally and like was and was really trying to get into a better place. And then as soon as I crossed that like threshold and got on the other side, and now I'm like healthy mentally and physically again. It's it's so much easier to like. Like you're saying, like it doesn't feel like it's about me anymore. Like it's like I was reading this and I was like, fuck man, this is what I'm going through. This is gonna be so hard to do. But now that I'm on the other side, it's so much easier and so nice to kind of, it's like very therapeutic. This was the song that was blaring in my ears as I inhaled the last breaths of tobacco, nicotina and whatever other poisons that were setting the foundation in my veins for their friends to soon join them. And I looked up into the sky and I saw a plane flying low over Manhattan. And for that split second, I got scared. Actually, it was a good 20 seconds. It wasn't a real scared. I, I mean, look, I, I've had anxiety attacks just being in a loud crowd. This was more thought-based. I'm a pretty smart guy, so I try to logically work through things before panic sets in. But that's the shitty thing about legitimately having an anxiety disorder. It doesn't matter how smart or logical you are. That shit will sneak up on you and it will knock you on your ass and probably take your wallet. Sometimes the fucked up part of my mind skips right over being logical and jumps straight into panic mode. But this wasn't one of those times. I, I was okay. Uh, I'm not sure how long you have to live in New York to become familiar with the airspace regulations. In the few times I've flown into New York City before, not once did we fly over Manhattan. And this plane was pretty low. Didn't help that two weeks earlier, during an office happy hour while watching that Jersey sunset, a co-worker talked about watching from her office window as the second plane on 9-11 flew towards that second tower. I, I, look, I can't even pretend to understand what those directly affected by the tragedy feel like, but when she said that, it was something new to me. Most of us, the lucky ones, watched it happen on TV. Myself from 2,000 miles away. During that time, I lived in Austin. 
Right before clocking in at a Chick-fil-A, where I'd spend the rest of my day getting updates from the occasional customer that popped in every 10 to 30 minutes. You didn't watch it live, you've most likely seen it played over and over on the anniversary of the horrific event. But, and this just can't be my perspective, watching it on TV really just made it feel like watching a TV show. Still, to this day, I have not met anyone who lost somebody on that day in September 2001. So it's, it's hard to make it real in my mind. But when I heard my coworker's story, it got a little more real. So, stupid as it may be, my heart sped up a bit when I saw this plane. I saw it fly over the Hudson, watched it disappear behind a building, and wondered if I would feel it hit. Was Jimmy Eat World too loud for me to hear it? Amazing still it seems On the 23 I won't always love what I'll never have I won't always love in my regret Amazing still it seems. I'll be 23. I won't always love what I'll never have. I won't always live in my regrets. That was the mood I was trying to set for myself. Uh, amazing as it seems, I'm 30 years old and thanks to movies and music, I have romanticized this city for almost as long. And because of that, every time I'm in this city, I fall in love with something I'll never have. But regrets are not something I struggle with. This city owns my heart, and every time I've been here, I've always been a visitor. I've always had to leave, but I'm here. I'm now. I'm ready. I live here now. I don't have to leave. Now, whatever I fall in love with will be something I can have, right? Not just part of a short dream that I'd inevitably wake up from. And I'm loving the character that I'm putting into it and, and the roller coaster rides that he goes through. I connect to every single, every single line in this book, which is just the coolest thing for me. Like growing up in a small town, but still having like the, the small punk scene and like, um, I just, I'm really digging the, the character that I'm, that I'm putting into it and, and just being out on the other side of everything. That, like we're both now like in the same position yeah. on the other side of this book and and being able to relate to it so much is just really rewarding for me. And, um, and everything about girls too, dude, like I, I'm, I'm putting all of my experience into my voice um, for these moments. And, and I'm, I'm, I don't know, man, it's, it's still just like therapeutic for me to, yeah. to, to read it all and to go through it and to put the characters and to relive that space. Like one time I did, I think like three chapters in one night and I felt like your character. I was just like, <laughs> yeah. no, I know. <laughs> it intense, I, that's like we talked about this. Like I, I was scared of that for you because of so your like new, new sobriety yeah. and like just how fucked up I was yeah. when I wrote this book. Um, that it could very well be. It could be triggering to some people. Sure. I don't want anybody to have to deal with that. If you go into reading it knowing that I'm still alive and I'm still here. That, that's why I want to do these things is so people can see where I'm at now and totally like not read this and be like, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to sure. take a bunch of pills and fucking write something like this. Like, no, like this was the worst, one of the worst parts of my life. Um, and now enjoy the roller coaster because I think it's a fucking entertaining story. Yeah, it really is. But know that like, the important part is coming out on the other side of it. Yeah, yeah, we're both on the other side, and like as triggering as it may be, it's, it's, it's. I don't think that it's going to suck people down a yeah. dark hole. Yeah, you know, I really don't. I, because why would you want to feel anything in this book? You yeah, know, like yeah. it should, it should like trigger you to get your shit together, Absolutely. so you don't feel or experience the pain that's in this book. Yeah, that's what it was. It wasn't fear. The thoughts that entered my mind weren't, we're under attack, or I'm gonna die. I, I thought, God, please don't let this happen again to this amazing city. It was like seeing a friend go through one too many bad relationships. I, I don't know how much more she can take. 
Within this 20 second thought process, while I lost sight of the plane and waited for the earth to shake, I also thought about my family in Texas. I'm not the best at keeping in touch with my little sisters who are still young enough to need their big brother around. I don't call my mom enough after that woman worked harder than anyone I know to make sure my brother and I knew that we could go somewhere in life. I have a niece and a nephew whom I could probably be more inspiring to, but definitely should check in with more often. I love those kids and every time I get to see them, and they love me back. But what about when we don't see each other? I remember when I was a kid, I rarely thought of my aunts and uncles who lived in other states or even the ones who just, you know, lived two hours away. Now, within that 20 seconds, I was almost sure something horrible was going to happen. I didn't panic. I didn't run for cover. I grabbed my phone and thought, get ready to dial someone and let them know you're okay. Because if you wait five seconds too long in those situations, it's too late. And everyone you love has the worst week of their lives worrying about you. Yeah. I, I didn't want that happening. It's strange how easy it is to feel alone in a city of millions of people. It's even stranger how no one tries to remedy that. I'm one of those people. The lonely and the lazy. I don't really know what to do about it. <laughs> Today, I legitimately thought for about 20 seconds that I was going to be directly affected by another 9-11. For the first time. I'm not paranoid. I fly a lot and I never fear my fellow passengers, no matter what they look like or, or what they're wearing on their heads. Look, I, I think the real fear today was not that I haven't lived enough, but um, that I haven't loved enough. And my main concern in that 20 seconds it took me to regain rationality was my family. I don't want them to worry about me. I love them and they know I do, even though I definitely don't tell them enough. I have given them plenty of reasons to worry. Xanax, Adderall, Ambien, Scotch, over the last few years. Maybe it shouldn't take a commercial airliner crashing into a building for me to call my little sisters and tell them that I love them. But family's different. You know, it's easy to call them up and say, I love you. But the girl. The girl. Ah, yes, there's a girl, isn't there always? She also worked her way into my mind during that 20 seconds, and it um, made me want to call her. It made me want to spend the weekend with her. It made me want to spend as much time as I could with her. You know, we only have good times together. So why shouldn't we spend the weekend together? Why shouldn't we spend our lives together? Because you have to play the game. We've known each other for years, but we've never lived in the same city, and now that we do, somehow it's still not the right time. Or at least she doesn't seem to think so. You'll sit alone forever if you wait for the right time. What are you hoping for? I'm sitting in one of the nicest hotel rooms I've ever been in in the middle of the greatest city in the country, some say the world, and I'm alone. See? I told you this was stupid. <laughs>